Hello everyone, welcome to all the tech enthusiasts and inspiring innovators to day two of Testmu conference. I am Spursh Kesri, a developer relations engineer here at Lambda Test, and I today will be your host of your session. So we will wait for a couple of seconds so that the attendees can join in. Meanwhile, uh, you can uh, say hello to Philippe in the chat as well as you can also write down which part of uh, which country are you uh, joining in. Uh, I am from India, and Philippe is joining from, from San Francisco. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have Richard from Chicago, uh, Alexander from Austria, M Michael from USA. Well, it's a very global community today. Really excited. Andrew from Brazil. Yeah, I think we have a good amount of attendees for a session. So let's start. Uh, do you ever wonder how contributing to open source can enhance your portfolio? Or are you are open source communities a good way to improve your technical skills and expand your knowledge? Philippe has covered. Philippe has got you covered. In this talk, he will guide us through the journey of cell discovery and improvement, demonstrating how diving into open source projects can be accomplished. Philip Norkun has been part of the tech industry for more than 20 years now and has been working with Netflix as a senior software engineer for the last six years, where he has helped us build UI delivered to millions of smart TVs and other streaming devices around the world. Join us in this enlightening talk as Philippe takes us on the tour of open source landscape using the intriguing example of Bitcoin open source ecosystem. This captivating case study will help you learn how open source initiatives offer something valuable for everyone, regardless of their background. Over to you, Philip. All right, thank you, Sparsh. Let me just start sharing my screen here with my slides. All right, and we are on. So hello, everyone. Uh, today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, open source, uh, how we can contribute to open source. And we'll be using uh, the Bitcoin ecos uh, ecosystem as a, a prime example to how to tap into uh, those projects. Uh, so before we start, a quick intro about myself. Uh, my name is Felipe. I'm originally from a city called Porto Alegre in Brazil. I lived in Sao Paulo for a while and then moved to San Francisco, in the, I think, 10 years ago. So I've been working with uh, Silicon Valley companies for the past 10 years, and those include uh, Yahoo, Tile, uh, Netflix for the past six years. And in my spare time, I also act as a quality advisor to the Mempool open source project that is in the Bitcoin space, which is one of the motivations uh, that brought me to this topic today. So before we start, like why open source? Uh, I would say that... Uh, I am only where I am at in my career today because of open source. Uh, I started my career as a tester and a developer many, many, many years ago. And one, I think the, the primary turning point of my career was when I started looking into automation for the projects that I was working on at the time. So this was back in 2005-ish. Uh, I was working an offshore company back in Brazil where we developed uh, web apps for uh, customers in the US. And back then, the only automation tool that we had access to as a company was Mercury uh, Quick Test Pro. So I was intrigued by other options that could be out there. And I found Water and Selenium, uh, which some of you may know, like Selenium is, uh, the name Selenium was uh, mostly as a joke to fight Mercury, like the Mercury poisoning. So that's why uh, they picked up that, that name, to have an option to treat the poisoning from Mercury and I have a, a industry class uh, open source project for automation. Um, I think you know, it's not just about the projects, but also the relationships that you build over year, uh, over the years and over the project. So I think the, the primary thing I see on open source is really the networking effect. It's really being able to tap into uh, talent that is global. Like you don't have to be uh, siloed in your hometown or in your laptop and just uh, limited to the people that you work around you, like you can really expand your horizon and your skill sets by working in a, with this global talent pool. So uh, other ob uh, objectives of working with open source is really for learning. Like if you have uh, any interest in any tech stack, 
you can learn from others. You can collaborate with others. We can uh, like submit issues. You can uh, you can submit even pull requests and ask for uh, for feedback so you can learn. And the networking part is also uh, huge, as I said. Uh, there are so many uh, strong communities built around specific projects. Uh, I can say that the Selenium one and Water uh, were really important to me because I helped uh, many people and I got help from so many people when uh, when we had uh, challenges on a daily basis. Like how do I do uh, work? How do I work with these electors here? How do I improve uh, the testability of my project? How can I uh, set up a continuous integration environment? How can I uh, just increase the velocity and increase the quality of my work by uh, helping others as well. Uh, as I said, it really helps with career growth. Like you're not limited to the, pro to the problems that are presented to you on your day job. Like you can uh, solve a problem for someone or solve a problem for yourself, but that problem can be used for uh, other people outside of your company, outside of your sphere of direct influence. Uh, an example I have of this is when I work at Yahoo, we were working on this uh, new mail client for Windows 8. And there was no uh, open source project or no way, not even for Microsoft, uh, there was no automation tool to automate Windows 8 apps. Like they were new, they were, brand, they were still working on the beta uh, OS at the time. So there was nothing we could do to automate it uh, at the time because it was a Win, uh, WinJS, like a Win, uh, Windows apps built on JavaScript framework that just didn't have any support from Microsoft to uh, automate. So knowing uh, how Selenium worked and how the API worked, it was easy for us on, in my team to build something that was based on Selenium using the same APIs, or at least like a, a small subset of APIs, just something that we would allow us to click on a button, uh, check if the window has changed the location, uh, check for the contents of uh, individual components in the same way that Selenium was doing. But on this completely new environment that was still uncharted and that nobody had any, uh, any solution for yet. So we took uh, the learnings from the Selenium project. We looked at the APIs. We implemented our own bindings using a Ruby at a time. So it, it was uh, very challenging to have the entire system working uh, on this beta OS, on these beta tablets, uh, things that were still a work in progress, uh, even at Microsoft. But we, we got far enough that we had a complete continuous integration and continuous deployment system built from the very early days of the project, which really sped up a lot uh, how we could develop and, and build this uh, Mayo app. Um, uh, then the next point is uh, building your portfolio. As I said, uh, if you're not solving a problem just for yourself, you're solving a problem for others, uh, your, uh, your reach will be far, uh, far bigger than just your direct influence, uh, your sphere of influence. So uh, always think of uh, generalizing your problems, generalizing your solutions so that other people can come up and uh, if they stumble upon it, they can learn from you, they can improve your work, they can even adapt and give you more ideas to work on it. And over time, you'll see that the solutions that you thought may have been just for you are solving, uh, are, are being used by others as well. And that really gives you a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment that uh, it's not just uh, something that you do, uh, you, you do and forget. Like it's really nurtured and uh, appreciated by other people. Like this project I mentioned that we open sourced from Yahoo at the time, uh, it, we got some traction from the community. We had some people who wanted to uh, use it, but uh, we ran into a problem that over time uh, we ended up working with other projects and we couldn't maintain it. So we're going to talk about maintenance a little bit uh, uh, later on. And uh, of course, like the sense of giving back, like once you, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you may be working with open source on a daily basis, like you use a lot of open source uh, tools. And uh, as far as if you can run the poll, I just wanted to have a sense of how many people contribute to open source, not just use open source, but really contribute. It can be through documentation or opening issues or helping uh, in forums. Like if you have any direct involvement into giving back, uh, to the projects and the community. I would love to hear from you just to have a sense of how many of you are already uh, contributing back. So giving back is a really, uh, really important aspect of it that uh, it, it would be good to have a good balance of taking advantage of the project, taking like, uh, like using it uh, for your own benefit, but also it's much more important to also give back and, and make the improvements to the frameworks and make improvements to the libraries that you use 
so that you solve the problem and you improve it for everyone who's also using it. So we'll look at the results later on. And now a segue to why Bitcoin. I feel like uh, a lot of people don't really know much about Bitcoin, uh, even though it's been around for more than a decade now. So I just wanted to highlight a few things uh, about it, just to give you some small idea of uh, how big the ecosystem can be. So first of all, uh, Bitcoin is a uh, cryptocurrency and it's decentralized, meaning that anyone can uh, run the project, they can fork the project, they can uh, make suggestions and improvements to it. There is no single company behind it. There is no single uh, person who is responsible for it. Like anyone can download the, the Bitcoin core client, run on their own machines or have a Raspberry Pi or a, a small server that we have a copy of the blockchain, which is the distributed ledger for all the transactions that have ever gone through the, the Bitcoin network. Um, it's censorship resistant, so nobody can take it from you if you do pro proper custody. It's permissionless. You don't have to ask for anyone's permission uh, to work on it uh, in any aspect of it. Like you can, uh, as I said, like there's so many uh, projects built on top of the protocol and there's so many uh, libraries that support uh, Bitcoin as a, as a currency. And it's uh, also future proof in the sense that uh, it will all outlast everyone who's alive in this generation. Like everyone who is investing into Bitcoin or, or spending their time into the Bitcoin ecosystem these days, they strongly believe that it's something that will really change the lives of uh, our children, our grandchildren. And we can predict exactly how many Bitcoin will be in circulation. Uh, I'm from Brazil and I've seen like many currencies uh, fall and collapse over the years. Uh, I've, I've seen a president seize um, funds from my family members that like they couldn't really use uh, their money anymore because their accounts were frozen. And it's something that you just can't do with Bitcoin. You can, uh, you can predict how many will be uh, available. It's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin out there. It's, code, it's uh, hard coded into the, the code base. You can see how this uh, monetary policy is implemented and nobody can change that. Nobody can, uh, no single person can change that without going through like peer review and consensus from the network. You just can't. So uh, it's uh, really strong against any kind of attack and it's supposed to build uh, to, to last forever. So uh, it will outlast all of us in this conference here to outlast my children, my grandkids uh, and so on. So it's also very private. Like nobody can say, uh, can tell like how much Bitcoin you do or do not have unless you really expose uh, that information to someone. And it's secure in the sense that, uh, again, like nobody can take it from you. Nobody can prevent you from uh, making transactions because it's a peer to peer uh, money system that if I want to send you Bitcoin overseas, we, I can. If you want to send me some Bitcoin, I can just share an address and you can send it and we wait for the transaction to be confirmed and nobody uh, can know, nobody will know about it. Nobody can, uh, can prevent that, uh, that transaction from happening. And since it's a huge ecosystem, there is something for everyone at all levels, whether you are a junior developer, a junior tester, a junior PM, or a senior or a staff, like there's always something for someone uh, to do. And on all development stacks. Uh, coming from an automation background, uh, I worked a lot in Java projects, but nowadays I'm mostly working on JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, a bit of, of Python here and there. But uh, on the Bitcoin ecosystem, there is any anything you can imagine. Like if you want, there's a lot of uh, projects that use Rust, which is something I really want to uh, delve into at some point. Uh, a lot of projects with, uh, that are more focused on uh, the front end technology. So you'll see more of JavaScript and you know, other uh, very popular frameworks. But if you want to learn about any language at all, if you want to use uh, any of those projects as an example, you can find something pretty much on anything you can imagine of. So you may be thinking as a tester, as a, as a early developer uh, or a developer, what can you contribute to the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem? And different projects will have uh, different needs. Like some of them uh, are gonna be uh, lacking some of like unit testing coverage or functional testing. Uh, a lot of the web projects, uh, I think that's where um, the automation background that I have really helped me get into this space. 
uh, because I, uh, I saw some projects out there that uh, had no task coverage at all. And I started to think of, okay, how can I help this project be more successful and be more uh, resilient to change and uh, find ways to improve the quality and also learn more about how transactions work, how blocks are mined, how things all, all fit together. And uh, there are so many open source projects for automation that you can also use to test open source Bitcoin projects. So whether you, are, you come from a Playwright background or from a, a Cypress or Selenium background, like they, you can use like actual uh, projects that are running in production within the, the Bitcoin ecosystem and uh, exercise what you learned or even learn more uh, how to do uh, better coverage using existing projects, which is something that I feel like uh, very cool. Like you don't have to rely on uh, using like to-do apps or uh, what do they call it? Um, there are some demo apps for, uh, I don't know, like any small uh, self-contained apps, like the to-do list, the, the, the coffee shop apps, or uh, anything that you can just like exercise, finding locators, finding, uh, interacting with uh, different pages. Like you can use uh, those real projects to have uh, a, a real impact. Uh, performance testing, again, uh, also building on top of the functional testing example, uh, things have to be really snappy and quick and you can use like so many good performance testing uh, open source tools out there to exercise and, uh, and learn from. Uh, CI, CD, uh, developer experience, project management, uh, there are many projects that, uh, because we have, so they have such a, a distributed team and a distributed set of priorities, they need some help just with uh, assigning priority to issues or assigning who gets to do the issues or assigning milestones and do some agile uh, development on and thinking of the backlog for the future releases. Like a lot of uh, projects are not very well structured in the sense that they are just taking uh, contributions from different people and they have a few main maintainers that will uh, will cut the release or will plan around the release but it's good to have some sort of organization that a lot of us who are doing this professionally on the uh, on, on in the industry can also help with uh, documentation uh, is also a great example just to get started into open source projects as you're trying to set it up uh, you may run into some problems around uh, how do I get started? Like, how can I do this thing or this other thing? Or even like how to contribute back to the project? There are many things you can do uh, just by working on documentation. Same thing with translations. Like all these projects are global. Like Bitcoin is supposed to be a global uh, distributed currency so that the more languages that are out there, the better. So you find many projects that have been developed by, I don't know, European, uh, developers or American developers, so they're mostly in English, but there's always uh, opportunities to translate to a local language and get used to how the translation process works, how uh, other, even like open source uh, translation platforms work and how we can uh, integrate that into the development for, uh, uh, workflow. Uh, reproducible builds is also very important. Once you download a binary of, let's say, a wallet app, you want to make sure that the code that is published on, on the open source tree is what ended up producing that build. So there are many efforts around doing reproducible builds for those mission critical projects so that you can uh, do the build yourself on your local machine and you compare that the end result will be the same as if uh, as, it, as it was built on uh, CI, for instance, or what is available uh, on the, the project's website. So how to get started? Like, what are some ways you can uh, do any of those contributions? Uh, there are some uh, uh, key ideas around it and how to pick one project. I would suggest that you should take a look at how active the community around the project is, how well maintained it is, like whether it's taking contributions or it's just uh, open, it's open source, but you can't really change anything in the code. You can only read the code. Uh, you can check if it's aligned with your interests. Like, uh, as I said, like if you want to le learn more about Rust, go for a Rust project or go for a Java project or go for a, a front-end project. And also take a look at the license so that it allows you to change the code, make contributions back to the, uh, to the project and uh, assign and whether you have to sign any CLAs or contribution agreements so that you don't get in trouble because you are contributing to a project that uh, it's beyond your control. It's a community-driven project. 
Uh, some initiatives are out there to compensate developers, to compensate people who contribute to the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, a few of them include OpenSats, uh, the Brink grants. There's a Summer of Bitcoin uh, program where uh, people, mostly volunteers, interns to a project during the summer, and then they get compensated for a few uh, Satoshis, which is a fraction of a Bitcoin uh, for their work. And there are also development bounties for specific features. So uh, let's say that there is this uh, one project that uh, they want to improve the documentation. They may offer uh, a compensation for that small, uh, small task, or they may offer you uh, compensation for building a more end-to-end uh, -end, uh, feature that users will be able to uh, take advantage of. So here are a few, uh, a few pointers of projects in different areas of the ecosystem that you can take a look at. So starting with mining, which is generating those coins. Like when, when you, the process of creating new Bitcoin is by this uh, process called mining. And there are a few options out there. Uh, Nerd Miner is a small, uh, a small uh, self-contained uh, device like this, which I have here which you can mine uh, with very low hash rate power. So you may not be able to get uh, like, like any Bitcoin yourself, but just getting uh, used to how mining pools work, how uh, Bitcoins are generated and so on, will give you an idea on that. Uh, then you have the full node projects, which are uh, systems that are run, uh, basically running uh, servers that will have the Bitcoin core client and a few other apps to explore the Bitcoin ecosystem. Here are a few options like Raspberry Blitz that uh, run on uh, Raspberry Pis. Umbrel uh, is, an, is another one that is very popular with uh, Raspberry Pi devices, but also runs on VMs and Linux VMs. Nix Bitcoin, Auto, or other great options. Uh, the indexers are the tools that you use to index all the, the transactions that happen on the blockchain so that when you look up a, a, a transaction or an address, you can easily uh, see what's in there. Uh, there are protocols and libraries like uh, Bitcoin Core itself, which is Bitcoin itself that runs on all the nodes. The library is for any language you can think of to actually interact with uh, wallets or interact with uh, the Bitcoin blockchain to get the address information or transaction details, things like that. So a great source for uh, practicing unit testing and, uh, uh, and adding coverage to those libraries. Then wallets, uh, which is what really allows you to uh, transact with Bitcoin, store Bitcoin. Uh, you can uh, look into the code card firmware. There's, uh, there are other, uh, other wallets like Zoos, Sparrow, Seed Signer, the Electron Wallet, Crux, Blue Wallet. All of those are great options that are all open source and uh, they usually take uh, contributions. Then payment processors that will allow you to transact or create a, a shop that people can pay uh, Bitcoin for you like the BT, BTC Pay server. If you want to run a store that accepts Bitcoin, we're probably going to be using a BTC Pay server. Then layer two solutions to scale the Bitcoin protocol, like uh, Liquid or Lightning, Bitcoin explorers like the BTC RPC or Mempool Space, uh, which I mentioned earlier in this presentation, or even like exchanges that will let you uh, exchange uh, money for Bitcoin or Bitcoin for other coins with uh, people uh, anywhere in the world, like BISC and RoboSats. So as you can see, it's a really big rabbit hole. Like I only touched the surface of a few projects and a few uh, initiatives that are out there that will cover development and fund development for the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I would strongly encourage you to go into the rabbit hole and look at uh, at least some projects, some po popular projects out there that will spark your interest into the new digital gold. So that's it what I had for today. Uh, I'm gonna be open for a few questions. So uh, I will also wanna see from Sparsh what the, the results from the poll were on how many of you are actually contributing to uh, any open source project already. Hi, Philip. Uh, so we haven't received much polls, uh, uh, much, uh, replies on the polls. I will just put up the poll once again. So, oh. hey, everyone in the audience, feel free to react to the poll. The question is, are you contributing to any open source projects yet? And when I say contributing, it's really 
not just using it, but really giving back. Like it's like you have you ever uh, feel any uh, issues or if you're supporting the, any project through the community when you know, people come up with questions that you have, you make any contribution contributions to the project uh, and just to give back to the project and the community. So I'm gonna vote. <laughs> and, <laughs> I will also do that. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that mostly not. Uh, I, can, I can see why. Like it's usually, um, it's a passionate work most of the times. Like it's something that you have to dedicate your own time for. And people have families, people have uh, their day jobs. So it's understandable that uh, we have a low participation rate back to give back to the project. But don't feel ashamed. It's really like people are doing uh, the contributions. Out, out of their own uh, spare time most of the time as well and but i'm just uh suggesting to try to get involved into any project that you're passionate about or any project that you use on a daily basis because it really opens up more doors like uh, as i said like i'm only where i am today because of like the contributions i made throughout the years and the people i've met uh, along the way and it's really about that it's building the relationships, building uh, your portfolio and learning uh, and teaching along the way. Definitely, I agree, Philip. Uh, even in my colleges, uh, everyone motivated to contribute back to open source, and I was very shy enough to get started. But a piece of advice came in, like, just get started and you will figure it out. And it was a very hard to get started. But once I figured it out, I, once I got the confidence to start contributing back, and it was just a breeze. Yeah, I feel like there is uh, there used to be like a higher barrier of entry uh, to make contributions because uh, like GitHub was not around. Uh, you couldn't easily uh, like clone a repository and work on it on your own. Then making contributions back, uh, like you didn't get much feedback or it was really hard. But nowadays, like there are so many uh, like GitHub actions that help you with like testing or your own changes, making sure that you're not causing any problems on the systems like you can do one click forks one click clones there is the, the github uh, desktop app you can use to pretty much do any operation that you would have to do on the, the command line so it used to be more intimidating but uh, the tooling is getting better the social aspects are also getting better people are more interested into doing things together rather than just uh, taking uh, and not giving back so definitely options are out there awesome uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, I will just uh, pick some questions from the Q&A session. And, uh, yeah. So the first question is asked by Jent. Uh, what challenges might arise when integrating open source co components with proprietary elements in cryptocurrency projects? Well, I think it's all about uh, the security aspects, right? If you, once you start looking into the, the code that is uh, out there, you can audit, you can see whether um, there are any backdoors or any uh, malicious code running. And it's a, a very common problem with uh, like integrating open source into your project that you don't control the entire uh, chain, like the, the supply chain. And some people may use uh, like some libraries as an attack vector to get into your system or into your, uh, your application and try to steal funds or anything uh, shady like that. So uh, you can't just blindly take like open source libraries and, and uh, assume that they are valid. Like you, even recently, uh, there was a big debate around one, uh, one Bitcoin library that is used on the Mastering Bitcoin book uh, that had uh, a very uh, how can I say that? So in order to create wallets and create uh, and create wallets, they had a random number generator. But the random number generating function was not random enough. So people figured out that they could uh, use an attack to calculate what those addresses would be, what the keys would be, and then steal funds from people who use that library in the past. Like it happened to like two people at the same time. They had, they had no connection uh, with, with each other whatsoever. But they got their funds stolen because, and uh, after some research, they found out that they both used the same library to generate their wallets and generate their uh, their seed phrases. That is what unlocks your wallet, and like it went unnoticed for years. Like a lot of people didn't know that uh, that that function being used was so weak. So you can't just take whatever is out there. You have to also do your due diligence to do the audit, uh, do some research, set up 
security audits to uh, constantly update the any patch releases and but not just take them like we have to really review the uh, what's changing and that's a problem with uh, we saw with python uh packages in the past like npm uh this happens all the time when people hijack packages and they inject some malicious code in there so that's probably the biggest threat or the biggest challenge that i would mention it's really the security aspect of it a great question thanks Philip. uh uh, coming to the next question, uh, this is asked by Rahul. What factors we should consider when selecting an open source testing tool for a specific testing requirement? Another great question. And I would say that it's really about uh, the license. Like, check what kind of uh, open source license there is. What is the team behind it? Like, how, uh, how frequent uh, or how um, well maintained the project is? Like I've seen a lot of people migrating from one project to another over the years because they didn't uh, they believe that the company that was backing that project was going to back it forever. But you know, when it, when there's a, a, a company behind it, you can uh, almost always assume that things will eventually change. Like they will be part of the roadmap, uh, and maybe people will leave the company, and some others will uh, join, and they, they will take some time for them to be up to speed uh, with the, how the library works, how the tool works. Uh, or it may just stop being a priority for the company itself. Like, why would they invest into this tool if uh, nobody is using it anymore or if it's just uh, a cost, uh, it acts as a cost to the company? So uh, I would look into, like, how uh, active the community is, how frequent they have updates, how transparent the, the tools are on their roadmaps, and primarily, uh, like, who's backing the, the work. Like, it's uh, just like individuals, it's at a company, uh, and we go from there. Yes. Uh, uh, we are just right on time, so I will just take up last question. So I'm clubbing two questions. The both are on uh, profitability and open source. So I'm just taking one question. What are your thoughts on uh, tools that have started open source and now are an enterprise like Catalan, Postman, Karate Labs? Red Hat. Uh, I think yeah, I think they're valid uh, tools. I like that they exist because they give uh, people more options and they provide different uh, level of support for uh, companies that are also like paying for the development. I, I feel like it's a good uh, symbiotic uh, relationship that uh, you you get some support, you get uh, premium support if you pay for it. Uh, but I, I feel like the, the companies have always ha they always have to be aware of where they came from. So if they were an open source project, they continue to uh, make some or most of your tool available through the open source community and then build around the ecosystem, build around the support that you can provide to it. Like for instance, Cypress is a great example where uh, if you have an open source project, you can run Cypress tasks and you can use a, the dashboard for free. But if you run it on, as an enterprise, then you have to pay for it and you have to get like this premium support from it. I, mean, I think many other co uh, companies uh, operate under the same uh, same level, like same model. So I, su I support uh, when they make sense. I support that when they give back to the community. Uh, and I think they should continue to have like that business model. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, that's about it. We are three minutes past our time. Uh, so thank you, Philip, for this amazing session. I hope uh, this session has inspired everyone to explore the world of open source in your own unique way. Uh, we will also be hosting all uh, our sessions in uh, as recorded sessions on YouTube. So you can go back and listen to them again and share with your peers as well. So happy testing. Have a nice day. See you soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Philip.